verse 12 to 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through 17. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we ask you that you will help us to understand your word. And so we ask you, Holy Spirit, that you will do your work in our hearts, in our midst. And that we will not only understand your word, that we will respond back to you, your word in a way that will truly honor you and glorify you. You know every single life here, God. You know where we are at. I pray that you will speak to each one of us very clearly and specifically. So we want to thank you, God, for what you're about to do in our midst. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 8, if you know, is considered to be one of the greatest chapters in all of the Bible, especially for the believer. It presents many blessings and realities as a result of being in Christ, including our eternal security. Now, particularly in verses 1 through 17, we see four truths or four great realities that are true of every believer. The first one is that all believers are freed from the condemnation. We see that in verse 1. And Paul says, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. The second reality in this verses 1 to 17 is that all believers are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And we've seen that last week about the indwelling Holy Spirit. The next two realities are found in today's passage. So the third one is that all believers have an obligation, and we'll look at it in a bit. And the fourth reality is the reality of the believer's adoption. There is no condemnation. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. We have an obligation, and the reality of the believer's adoption. But we're going to look at the last two this morning. And as we look into this passage, verses 12 to 17, this passage can be broken into four statements or four arguments that flow from one to another. And so here are those four truths. Those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit have an obligation to pursue holiness. That's number one. Number two, those who pursue holiness are led by the Spirit of God. Number three, those who are led by the Holy Spirit are the children of God. And finally, those who are the children of God are the heirs of God. That's what we're going to look at this morning. So number one, those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit have an obligation to pursue holiness. 
If you look at verse 12, it begins with the phrase, so then, which tells us that it is connected with the previous passage, the verses of 9 to 11. And in verses 9 to 11, the dominant theme of these, uh, of this passage is that believers are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And so Paul is saying in verse 12 that since we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, so then brothers and sisters, we, have, we are not debtors to the flesh, but to, to live according to the flesh, but we are in fact debtors to the Spirit to pursue holiness. Since we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, under the dominion of the Holy Spirit, we are not indebted to the flesh. Our obligation is not to the flesh anymore, but our obligation is to the Spirit. What has the flesh done for us? What has a sinful nature done for us that we should continue to be serving our sinful nature? It only made us slaves to sin. It made us hostile to God. It ruined us in every way. And in fact, the verse continues and says, that somebody continues to live according to the flesh. It leads to death because it shows that there is no work of the Spirit in their lives. And such lives will surely end in eternal death. But believers have been given the Holy Spirit as a gracious gift so that He can sanctify us. The question is, how can we then be indebted to the flesh? How can we live as we want to? Brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. An obligation to pursue holiness. By the way, the language of obligation or indebtedness is all over the New Testament. If you come to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, this is what Paul says. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What Paul is saying here, after you know, talking about different elements of the gospel from chapter 1 to chapter 11, he's saying in chapter 12, he's saying, in view of all the mercies of God that you have seen and experienced, offer your bodies as living sacrifice. You have an obligation if you have experienced the mercy of God. If you have experienced the grace of God, you have an obligation to pursue holiness. Not just that, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 to 19, this is what Peter says, But he who called you is holy, and you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And, and if you come to verse 18, it says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Again, once again, what Peter is saying here is, you know, you need to pursue holiness, first of all, because God is holy, but also he's saying, because you were bought not by imperishable things like silver or gold, but something more precious than that, and that is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Because you were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, you have an obligation to pursue holiness. And some, a verse that is closely connected to our passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20, where Paul asks, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own, 
for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. He's talking about a price that was paid to purchase you, but he's also reminding us, listen, you're not your own because the Holy Spirit has made his dwelling in you. And that's why you have an obligation to glorify God in your body. Since the Holy Spirit himself lives in us, my friends, this is, the, this is what is the truth. We cannot make peace with our flesh. We cannot make peace with the sinful nature anymore. That is still lingering in us. We cannot make peace with sin. In fact, as John Piper says, we must make war against sin in our lives. This is our obligation. Notice the language of Paul here in this verse. He says, put to death the deeds of the flesh. He doesn't say, take it easy with your sin. He doesn't say, treat it as a pet. He doesn't say, pamper it. Or, you know, it's, it's okay to somehow play with sin in your life. He's, it's very clear. He says, put to death the deeds of your body. The sinful nature that is, you know, keeps coming up, showing up in your life. Put to death. In other words, be killing sin. The famous Puritan, John Owen, who wrote an entire book called Mortification of Sin on this one single verse. In this book, he says, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. My friends, we have an obligation. We have a call. And that is to be ruthless with sin in our lives. So may I ask you this question this morning? Are you being ruthless with sin? Or have we become comfortable are we people who are okay with entertaining sin in our lives? When we come here on a Sunday morning, you know, we have this nice, you know, holy, you know, atmosphere. But when you go back and when it is Monday to Saturday, you somehow entertain sin and you pamper it, you're comfortable with it. Friends, we cannot play with sin. We have an obligation. We are called to put it to death. But how, how do we do that? Three things. First of all, if you notice, we must not miss this in verse 13. If, it says, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. One thing we need to remind ourselves in our fight or in our pursuit of holiness, we are powerless without the help of the Holy Spirit. It's not about a set of rules. It's not about a set of disciplines. It is yielding to the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit who is powerful will cause that in your life. The second thing that I was thinking of is we have to learn to starve our sin, our habits to death. Paul says in uh, Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, make no provision for the flesh. Put on Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Do not keep, you know, don't expect to have victory over your sin in your life if you're constantly exposing yourself with sin. It doesn't work that way. If you're feeding your sin from time to time, your sin is not weakening, it's only growing stronger, my friends. And there is no way you will be able to put to death. 
And not only are we to starve it to death, we must wield the sword, so the sword of the Spirit. In a, in a war, we need an offensive weapon in order to kill our enemy. And do you know the Holy Spirit has a weapon to kill sin in our lives? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 says, The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God to kill sin in our lives and make us holy. And so if you're someone who stays away from the Word of God for long periods of time, there is no way, my friend, that you will be battling sin and being, uh, you are being victorious in your life. Our responsibility is to immerse and saturate ourselves with the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. And the Spirit of God helps us to put to death those sins. So I don't know what sins you are truly battling with right now, but here's how you can put to death those sins in your life. And, but having said that, this killing of sin and growing in holiness is not a one-time event. It's not a one-time thing. It doesn't happen overnight. Growing in holiness and, and killing of sin is a process. Sin is like these weeds that grow in the garden. As you weed them out, they will come back. As long as we are in this body, in this fallen world, we will have to fight with sin. It's an everyday battle. But praise God. We, have to, we don't have to fight in our own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. He also says in verse 13, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. He's not saying your holiness is what has achieved your eternal life, but your sanctification or your ongoing growth in holiness is a proof of your salvation, and hence you have eternal life life. And before we move on, so let me ask you, are you growing in holiness? When you look at your life, do you see the work of the Spirit in your life? Do you see that you are being sanctified? Are you intentionally killing sin in your life by the Spirit? That's number one. Number two, those who pursue holiness are led by the Spirit of God. Verse 14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit. Again, the word for is a connection to the previous verse. In other words, all that Paul said about killing sin is a result of being led by the Spirit of God. Now, people generally say, I was led by the Spirit to do such and such a thing. Now, when they use phrases like that, they think of it in terms of guidance in decision-making. Although that is true, but the phrase led by the Spirit is not talking about guidance you know, in decision-making. It is more than guidance there. To be led by the Spirit is to be governed by the Holy Spirit. It is to live under the moral government of the Holy Spirit. It is to experience and yield to the active involvement and power of the Holy Spirit in your lives. And that's why those who are truly pursuing holiness and are being sanctified, they are the ones who are led by the Holy Spirit. In other words, they are the lives that are being governed by the Holy Spirit. And so, those who are truly led by the Holy Spirit, here are some of the characteristics or features of their lives. They are sensitive to sin. 
those who are truly led by the Holy Spirit are, are convicted by their sin. They are broken over their sin. They grieve over the things that the Holy Spirit grieves over. They hate, they begin to hate the things that the Holy Spirit hates. They continually wage a war against sin in their lives. And all this results in a growing obedience to God. So if you claim to say, I am I'm always led by the Holy Spirit, you know what is the truest mark of that? Obedience to God. A person who is powerfully influenced by the Holy Spirit. It's, it's not cannot be measured simply by a gift or something somebody can do. No, it's the authenticity of that is godly character. Obedience. There are times people do the exact opposite of what the Word of God says and then come and claim to be led by God and have the peace of God. In my view, that is such a false peace. The Spirit of God never leads you into disobedience to, his, to the Word of God. A life that is truly led by the Spirit of God conforms more and more to the Word of God. It is in growing measure aligned to the Word of God, which continues to bear the fruit of the Spirit. And this life is renewed each day to be transformed into the likeness of of Jesus Christ. So those who are pursuing holiness are the ones who are led by the Spirit of God. Here's the third one. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Verse 14 says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. All those who are governed by the Spirit of God and yield to Him and are, um, and as a result, growing in holiness and Christ-likeness, show themselves to be the children of God, which is a legal status of every believer. Now, this is one of the compelling reasons. One of the compelling reasons to pursue holiness is because we have been adopted into the family of God. And because God is holy and you are part of His family, you pursue holiness. Now, brothers and sisters, we were not always children of God. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3 that we were by nature children of wrath. We were under the wrath of God because of our rebellion against God, which we fully deserved. And yet God did not leave us in that state, but sent his son, Jesus, so that he can take our wrath upon himself. And according to John chapter 1 and verse 12, but to all who did receive him, and that is Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. We were not always children of God. We were children of wrath. And because of what Christ has done, and because of trusting in Jesus, we were adopted by God. And hence given this, the legal status or the right to become the children of God. Brother, sister, this is the, one of the greatest or the highest points of the gospel message. And our greatest privilege that the children of wrath should be adopted as children of God because of Jesus Christ. And this is what 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, this verse echoes that. Where it says, see what kind of love the Father has given us, that we, that we 
who were children of wrath should be called children of wrath should be called the children of God. And so friend, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, this can be true of you too if you receive Jesus and believe in his name. You too can be forgiven and you can go back home this morning as a child of God. The question is, will you trust in Jesus today? Now, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is an authentication that we are truly the children of God. There are times we can go around and say, I'm a child of God, I'm a child of God. But you know what is a proof of that? Is a sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you truly belong to God, then you will behave like God. Because, the, because believers no longer, if you, if you look at those verses in um, verse 15 onwards, believers no longer live in slavery to sin. They fear no condemnation. They no longer live in insecurity or they, they do not live legalistically in order to somehow appease God or gain His acceptance. Instead, we have received a spirit of adoption, evidenced by our intimate relationship with God, so much so that we can call God our Abba, Father. The word Abba in Aramaic means father, or, you know, like a child calls a father, Daddy. Paul is using this word here because this is how Jesus addressed the Father, especially in Mark chapter 14 and verse 36 in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is used here to show that this is the same level of intimacy and relationship that believers have been brought into with God. This, my friends, is our greatest privilege that we can call God our Heavenly Father. And verse 16, it says, The Holy Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. In other words, His work of sanctification not only authenticates that we are the children of God, but the Holy Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. There will be times of discouragement. There will be times we may mess up. There may be times that we may stumble. But the Holy Spirit assures us, gives us the assurance that we are truly the children of God. And finally, the fourth thing is this. Those who are the children of God are the heirs of God. Verse 17 is what it says. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Not only are we bestowed this glorious privilege of being called the children of God, but because we are children of God, we are also heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, we are told that as God's children, we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiling, and unfading, which is kept for us in heaven. Every inheritance that you receive here on this earth by your parents is going to perish, my friends. But the inheritance that we are going to receive one day from God is imperishable, undefiling, and unfading. In other words, eternal. 
what we have experienced and continue to experience in Christ here and now, in one sense, is only a glimpse in comparison to the future glorious inheritance that awaits all believers. Are you excited about it? No? Now, some people misunderstand this verse about being heirs and co-heirs with Christ. They think it is about here and now. And such misunderstandings, out of such misunderstanding comes out this name it and claim it theology. They think that since I'm an heir of God and co-heir with Christ, I must live like a king in this world. And so I, need, I can name anything and claim anything for myself, all that I want, because everything that God has is yours. That's not what this verse is saying. It's talking about the, the future glory of the believer. If you notice the condition here in this verse, the last part of this verse, and, and all those who propagate that kind of theology, forget the last part of the verse. Look at the last part of the verse. It says, Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. There is an inheritance that is a future inheritance. We already started partaking in this. But it is a future glory that Paul is talking about. But there is a condition for it. And that is, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The path, the path to future glory is through suffering in the present. Without suffering, there is no glory. Without enduring suffering, you know, it, it probably shows you're not a true believer. Without carrying the cross daily, there is no crown. Without suffering with Christ and for Christ in this world, there is no future glory, my friends. And so as children of God, by adoption, we must suffer with him before sharing in his glory. Brothers and sisters, as I wrap up, let me say this. This world is not our home. As Christ followers, we will suffer for a time in this world. But what is to come is incomparable. The future glory is incomparable. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has in store for his people. And so may we not look for comfort and pleasures of this world, but may we live faithfully in the midst of our momentary suffering, knowing that an imperishable, unfading, and eternal inheritance is waiting for us who are in Christ. Also, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, my friend, you too can be part of this eternal inheritance. If you can come to Jesus this morning, if you can repent of your sin and trust in Jesus as the only Savior of your life, and that very moment you will become a child of God. And when you are a child of God, you are an heir of all his promises. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we want to thank you so much for this passage. It gives us so much joy. It gives us comfort while we navigate through various difficult situations in our lives, we can hope in this, that we have a glorious future awaiting us. We are also comforted by the fact, Lord God, that you call us your children. 
and that we have access, that we can have an intimate relationship with you. And yet, Lord, because we are your children, because we have the Holy Spirit in us, you also call us to be ruthless with sin in our lives. So help us, God. Help us. If there is anyone here who still does, does not know you, I pray that you will graciously open their eyes, that they might see who they are, their condition, and a need for a Savior in their lives. Do that, God, for the glory of your name and their good. For Christ's sake, we pray. Amen.